Hi everyone, thanks for having me. It's great to be talking to you today. Um, this is the story of our paper published in Conservation Physiology with my co-author Mailing Neo. As, as, as I was preparing this talk, I realised there's quite a lot to talk about uh, in this paper. So I've tried to keep some of the examples kind of eco-physiology focused, maybe rather than some of those field-based studies, um, but all the information is in the paper, so you can always refer back to that if you need to. So I pre-recorded this talk for you today um, while I'm at the university because our internet at home, we live just outside of Townsville in Queensland, Australia, can be a little bit patchy. So I pre-recorded it while I'm at university today um, and I'm going to be online um, with you um, after for the Q&A session. So I just wanted to start a bit about the relevance. Obviously, this talk is going to be about giant clams, but I also know that Society of Experimental Biology um, really favours those connections between scientists and disciplines. So what I thought would be good for you to think about during this talk is about giant clams, but also how they can relate to other organisms that use solar energy. And I'll talk more about giant clams being solar powered later on such as the, uh, animals like plants and corals, and also how this might relate to other, other threatened species that you may work on. So I've got a uh, sea cucumber icon here, get the pointer, um, and also other threatened species, and a kind of the combination of both. So those species that might be threatened, uh, solar powered, and we don't know about the, their vulnerability yet. So perhaps they're even yet to be accessed. In, in terms of their extinction risk. So um, perhaps some of those things to think about as we go through the talk. Um, I've also uh, introduced a little bit of background about myself. So um, my name uh, obviously is Suan Watson. So I'm a senior scientist and curator of marine invertebrates at the Museum of Tropical Queensland, which is the Townsville campus of the Queensland Museum Network. Uh, I also work at James Cook University as a senior lecturer. So in case you haven't met before, my science background is I'm originally from the UK where I studied biology um, and then I moved to Southampton to study a master's in oceanography where I worked on deep sea marine invertebrates. I continued at Southampton for a PhD where I also worked with the British Antarctic Survey investigating uh, ecophysiology in polar and temperate marine invertebrates. And I came to James Cook University um, as a research fellow and then now a lecturer as I mentioned and I also had that job with the museum. Um, so kind of incorporating both of those um, positions now. The research that we do in our group tends to be focused uh, on the responses of marine organisms to environmental change and how this might affect their ecology, ecophysiology and biodiversity. So we tend to focus on change through space. So this might be a long natural biogeographical gradient such as latitude and there's a couple of examples of research here. And also change through times so that could be responses to environmental change, light warming uh, and ocean acidification. And so here there's just a couple of examples and we've actually been looking at how ocean acidification uh, can alter behaviour. Uh, we also work with threatened species, so the giant clam example here, and we'll hear more about that obviously in this talk. And that museum role really involves the collection of new specimens, their curation, involvement in the planning of exhibitions, and then engagement as well. So now to the story of the paper. So this paper really began in uh, 2019 at the SEB conference um, that we went to. And so the paper or the talk was presented in the Threatened Plants and Animals session, Can Understanding Physiology Inform Conservation Strategies? 
Um, as part of that session, there was going to be a special issue in conservation physiology on threatened species. And so I had the last talk at the very last day of this conference and I had um yeah I remember afterwards we just had a chat about it and so I thought that yeah I would write this paper um but I would need to sort of bring on um a collaborator so who's going to be team clown for the paper and so I decided that it would be really great to invite uh, Mailing Neo onto this paper. I've wanted to work with Mailing for a while. She is a giant clam expert and uh, she has this really great background on working across all different species of giant clams. And I have more of that experimental and uh, global change background. So I thought it would be really good. So the, together in 2021, uh, we sat down and we wrote this uh, paper. Uh, it was obviously virtual because no one was allowed to travel. Mailing is based in Singapore and I'm from, yeah, based in Australia. And so we put this paper together, I think in about six weeks at the start of 2021, um, just using sort of the cloud. So we would just write paper when we were at the text when we were in our different time zones and then uh, get on together. So it was a really fun collaboration to do. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, the ability to sort of, I guess, be a little bit more opinionated in a perspective article than it might be in a normal sort of research paper. So the basis of why we really wanted to study um, our marine invertebrates uh, and particularly giant clams. Well, um, invertebrates we find are so important. They're so biodiverse and they make up about uh, 98, 99% of the animal diversity in the oceans. And they can be highly abundant. And they can include commercially important uh, groups. Cultural significance is obviously also important. And they tend to really sort of form these fundamental lower levels in food webs, which then structure marine ecosystems and trophic dynamics. And importantly, invertebrates are actually often understudied on coral reefs, where people tend to work on the fishes and the corals. Um, the corals obviously being invertebrates, but you know, ones that are, are quite sort of obvious and dominant. But there are this whole suite of other invertebrate species um, that often go understudied. So one of those uh, that we have chosen to work on obviously are the giant clams. So I thought I'd show you a bit about the giant clams, see if we can get this to work. The giant clams, a true giant clam, can get to 1.3 metres in length. They can weigh 250 kilograms and be around about 100 years of age, we project like trees that actually have rings in their shells, so you can actually count and age them. So importantly, once settled on to coral reefs, um, giant clams don't move. Uh, here we have the, uh, some examples of the 12 species of giant clams, um, and they sort of really range in size, uh, but you can see that they are large animals. They have this planktonic larval phase, and then they choose where to settle, uh, and that's it, they, they can't move. They also take a long time to reach maturity. So this could be sort of about two to 10 years. They start off as male, then they, then, then they turn female. And um, so they take that long time to really be able to produce those um, female gametes. So they can also have other important roles on coral reefs. So, um, for example, they um, provide habitat for other, um, you know, for fish and coral and other animals. Um, they filter the reefs, so they're like the vacuum cleaners of the coral reef. They biofilter um, the food out of the water column. And they're also important contributors to the carbonate budget. So for calcification, they can provide up to 9% of um, the carbonate budget in areas like the Red Sea. Giant clams, as I mentioned, are actually solar powered. And what this means is sort of the heterotrophic. So they can obtain energy by filter feeding and also um, through their algae and their tissues um, which can capture sunlight and provide energy to the clam host in the form of sugars. 
And this extra energy is one of the reasons that giant clams can really grow so big. So this is really good. They've got this extra superpower. But actually, their superpower can also turn out to be problematic because just like corals, giant clams can bleach. Um, and so this is a photo of a partially bleached giant clam, and this is a completely bleached giant clam. This is a really large individual, and this photo was taken in 2016 during the 2015-16 coral bleaching event on the Northern Great Barrier Reef. And this individual later died. So what happens is that the uh, giant clam expels all the symbiotic algae from its tissues. The tissues are white, um, but then it doesn't get enough energy. And uh, if conditions stay like that for too long, then it will die. The giant clams on the Great Barrier Reef are actually considered iconic species. Of the eight key iconic species to see on the reef, the giant clam is the only invertebrate. So I guess they were quite you know, interesting in that sense. They're actually also the only one of those uh, iconic species that stay set in their same location, which means that tourists going out to see them are guaranteed a sighting, whereas those other um, organisms you know, can move around a bit more. However, giant clowns are faced with a range of pressures from humans. Um, they're a valuable source of food protein within the Indo-Pacific region. And actually the main invertebrate harvested from Pacific island countries um, by gleaning and free diving. So they face a lot of pressure there. Giant clowns also face pressures from the ornamental trade. So their shells are used to make these beautiful carvings. Um, and also uh, they're recently sort of um, a key animal traded in the ornamental aquarium trade as well. So people will keep them in their tanks as reef pets. So there's a range of pressures that giant clams face um, that is sort of, you know, pushing them potentially to extinction. Now, what we're seeing is that because of overexploitation, giant clams are now extinct in areas of their former range. They're actually sort of retracting in their range. And so traditional conservation solutions to try to help with this um, include giant clams being CITES listed species. So actually protected under Appendix 2 and international trade is banned. Giant clams are also on the IUCN red list of threatened species. They're listed as vulnerable for several species, but this currently needs updating because only nine of the 12 species have been assessed. Conservation efforts that have been underway to address these problems of overexploitation include breeding programs. Um, and these have been um, quite successful in local areas. However, there are new cha challenges that we're realising giant clams are facing. So we know species have been responding to change through time. On coral reefs, for example, we've had five mass extinction events in the past. And we can get ideas of the kinds of rates of um, of global change, including ocean acidification, in previous mass extinction events. But what we're seeing now is this really rapid global change. For example, 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001. Oceans take up 90% of the heat that we emit from burning fossil fuels, and they also take up about 30% of the carbon dioxide. Once in the oceans, the carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. And there's this acid that causes ocean acidification. We know ocean acidific uh, chemistry is changing really rapidly and actually potentially more rapidly than several million years. Ocean acidification causes problems for animals that make um, calcium carbonate or these lime sh stone shells and skeletons. Uh, includes problems with their survival, development, calcification, physiology, other general life history traits, 
and also refining problems in behaviour for animals that even don't make a calcium carbonate shell or skeleton like squid. So our giant clams are facing these new challenges in a rapidly changing world. They include some of those global scale drivers that I mentioned, and also some additional ones that we considered in the paper, including deoxygenation and salinity change. As well, giant clams face local to regional scale drivers that could cause stress, including light availability, which may be altered by processes of agriculture and urbanization that lead to turbidity and sedimentation in the water. Giant clams also face pollution, which might be physical um, in terms of say plastic material or more chemicals such as for heavy metal runoff. So we really started some of this research with asking the question of how can experimental findings inform the management of giant clams and indeed other solar powered organisms potentially such as corals to anthropogenic environmental stresses. So we've run some experiments and these are sort of, this is based on some other papers that we have made. And we really started to find out at this point that elevated temperature and elevated carbon dioxide levels tend to reduce survival in giant clams. So here, this is after 60 days. And you can see that the increasing temperature here leads to a decrease in survival, whereas increasing temperature and increasing CO2 leads to sort of the most dramatic decreases in survival. And so what we started to do was to sort of build on those findings from that research and say, okay, so what's happening currently? Well, actually what we can see is that abnormally high heat stress already affects the range of all of our 12 species of giant clam. That's our 12 current recognized species um, and their uh, abbreviations and names are listed here. And so this is really interesting because that Indo-Pacific warm pool um, where temperatures are permanently over 28 degrees has expanded nearly twofold in the last 40 years and now covers much of the Indo-Pacific region. So we're seeing this overlay of heat stress. Plus in certain years, and this is for the year 2016, you can see that sort of the red colours and the sort of the orange colours being heat stress that we don't normally see, um, but that's really present in, in large areas of the range. So it's not really a future problem, it's a current day problem for heat stress. Now animals can respond to heat stress by changing their latitudinal distribution. So for example, they can um, move um, south in the Southern Hemisphere or North in the Northern Hemisphere and take advantage of the planetary temperature gradients and exhibit a poleward range expansion. And actually there are citizen science projects that measure this. I'm involved in one called RedMap here, where we're tracking species moving along the coast around Australia. So for giant clams, however, the problem with the poleward range expansion is that as you move towards the poles, temperature does decrease, but also you get saturation state decreasing. Now, this is a measure of the saturation state of seawater with respect to calcium carbonate polymorph, which is what giant clams use to make their shell. Aragonite is the major polymorph that giant clams will use in their calcium carbonate shells. And aragonite saturation state decreases as you move the water towards the poles, which means it's more difficult for giant clams to make their shells as they move towards the poles. What we also see as we move polewards is that these light levels decrease. So it seems like for giant clams, moving polewards isn't going to be a very viable option. And instead, what we're going to see as temperatures warm is a reduction in available latitudinal habitat size. Additionally, in certain areas for giant clams, we even get a poleward migration barrier, such as in the Red Sea. So giant clams wouldn't be able to move any further north because of the barrier the Red Sea ends. 
So what we tried to do here was in a couple of maps in the paper, we had a look at the effects of ocean warming and heating. And um, so here the, um, the onset of severe heat stress occurs most rapidly uh, in the most equatorial areas in giant clam ranges. And the onset of the worst um, stress in terms of ocean acidification, so the greatest decline in aragonite saturation state occurs um, closer to the poles. So what you can see from this diagram is that there's essentially no safe haven here for giant clams. They're either sort of hot or it's hard for them to make their shells. The kinds of other factors that we included um, in terms of our known experimental responses um, were what we know about how giant clams perform at low light and high CO2. So if we look at three levels of carbon dioxide conditions, in high light, the survivor of giant clams after 60 days stayed the same. However, as we decrease light levels, we can see that we were getting reductions in survival at these mid and high CO2 levels, but not in the control. Then if we went to very low light levels in our experiments, we got reductions in survival, but control mid and high CO2 levels. We also know from our experiments that what we get at low light and elevated CO2 is a decrease in survival, as I mentioned, which is a lethal effect, but we also get a decrease in growth in terms of mass and shell deposition. So these are sub-lethal effects that low light and high CO2 are causing in our giant clams. And we know this from doing sort of our eco-physiology type experiments. So what we want you to do with this information is to project how these threatened giant clams might respond on the reef in the wild. So if we had, so we drew a conceptual model. So pre-industrialization, this is the, the depth range of giant clams on reef for many on the reef for many species. And then we thought about, okay, so what's happening in the present day? Well, in the present day, what we have is this pressure on the upper depth range from ocean warming, marine heat waves, and very high light intensity. So as you can see from those bleaching photos, um, we're tending to lose those individuals and particularly those ones that live in the very shallow waters. And then we continued, so in future oceans, what we know from those experiments that I just talked about is that there's likely to be pressure on the lower depth range from ocean acidification. So the giant clams are gonna need more light to meet their energy demands as oceans acidify into the future. Plus there's gonna be continued pressure on their upper depth range. And overall, this is likely to reduce the habitat availability within a giant clam species depth range. And this approach is kind of conceptual model, what we think may well be applied to other sessile photosymbiotic animals such as reef building corals. <clears throat> so we also thought about how giant clams may be able to adapt and whether there were any kind of rapid adaptive responses that might occur. So actually in giant clams, they're able to open and close their shell somewhat. So this varies depending on the size of the species, but they can open and close their shell a little bit. They can also retract their mantle tissue into their shell somewhat, and this allows them to um, help to avoid uh, fish predation, but also allows them the ability to escape some of the extra high sunlight and UV radiation during periods of stress. We also know that the giant clam is considered a holobiont, so as well as the animal, it has the plants, the algae, as well as bacteria, fungi, and viruses associated with it. And so the giant clam as the holobiont, um, although giant clams themselves have this really long generation time, 
the microorganisms associated with giant clams have much shorter and more rapid generation times. And so there is potential for these to um, you know, display some genetic adaptation um, and, and so overall display a rapid adaptive response for the hollow biome. In addition, the giant clam holds its microalgae within its mantle tissues. And this is actually different from how coral hold their symbiotic algae. And so this could confer some bleaching resistance in clams. Now we also know that organisms it, um, display a phenotypic plasticity and of course the ability for genetic adaptation. However, because look, giant clams are long lived, and so giant clams that uh, spawn into today's oceans are potentially going to be alive to the end of the century and they'll only get developmental acclimation to today, as well as that they take a long time to reach maturity. So that generation times are more limited compared to other reef animals and add in the over harvesting of large individuals, um, which are the female ones means that phenotypic plasticity and genetic adaptation may be a more limited response in giant clams. On the plus side though, giant clams do have mass spawning events where millions of gametes are released into the water column, allowing a massive potential for selection. So what I wanted to talk about now is so some conservation strategies that we could use through lack of environmental change. And I'll first talk about the management of local and regional conditions while global carbon dioxide emissions are stabilised. So for this, we drew a conceptual model. And what we put together was, if you can imagine the, um, the reef image that I showed you before, so giant cloud depth distribution on the reef. And um, so this is the same. So on the y-axis, so depth or ocean darkening, that might be caused by turbidity or sedimentation, and then light availability up here. So these tend to be local to regional scale changes caused by um, the influence um, of activities within the catchment leading into the water. And then on the x-axis, we have sort of this global scale um, factors mainly CO2 level, which leads to temperature, increased temperature and carbon dioxide. And so we can see we have this sort of sweet spot here of no effect. So this is where giant clams would like to live on the reef. This is sort of too shallow for them and these, this is too deep, there's not enough light. And then within the range, it's sort of out of the no effects range, we have sublethal effects and then we have mortality. Now, what we thought about when we wrote this paper was that if we could improve water quality to um, uh, enhance light levels on a local scale, this might help to um, conserve giant clams by improving the water conditions while global emissions are stabilised. And so if we think, so if we had turbidity and sedimentation, so if we perhaps remove some of that turbidity from human activity and we end up with them, um, better light levels in the water, and then we do that again, we might start to move giant clams from these sort of sublethal effects and mortality levels up to the better area of no effects. And then of course with um, carbon dioxide emission reductions, um, if we get to net zero by 2050, or if we get to net zero by 2035, this is gonna have an effect on where we end up in terms of CO2 level. And then if we get to beyond net zero emissions and when we get to push back, this will move that x-axis back. So this is a way that we sort of try to conceptualise how we could sort of best position um, different uh, factors that we could control, so local to regional and then global, to create that sort of safe space for giant clams on the reefs. So we've talked about that first one. We also identified a few other options in the paper and they included adaptive population management. So as well as addressing some of those local challenges that I mentioned, um, we could do monitoring, more monitoring of giant clams and during times of um, bleaching events and warm heat waves. 
as well as translocation of individuals from um, areas that are really getting hit by heat waves to other areas on, on the reef and perhaps to higher latitudes. We could also consider selective breeding of tolerant giant clam holobionts for restocking programs. And so we could choose individuals that have been sort of tolerant to ocean heating conditions, or and we could get animals um, in an aquaculture setting and um, give them extra heat, either kind of chronically or a marine heat wave situation and, and uh, allow them to acclimate to those conditions and select individuals that um, adjust the best to those. Giant clams are not born with their symbiotic algae, they actually acquire it in early life. And so it's possible to introduce uh, more tolerance strategies of microalgae to giant clams in that early life stage. And so this could be a way to help with the rapid adaptation of giant clams as a whole, um, the whole uh, animal. We also identified in the paper that we could try to value tourism potential more. Since giant clams are iconic animals, we know that they're already used in snorkel trails and clam gardens in certain areas. They could be considered a flagship species. And also if we try to value how much uh, revenue is produced by tourists going to see giant clam individuals, then that might sort of incentivize the protection of giant clams as well. And people have done this with manta rays, for example. Now, some of these ideas might sound a little bit far-fetched, but we actually went through and reviewed what was um, already being done. And this is a little bit of uh, just a display from the table in the paper. If you're interested, you can go and read that. But in some areas, there are quite um, sort of active management plans for giant clans. Well, where to from here? Well, we identified that we will need more experimental work on giant clams, more work on global change drivers, understanding the effects for each of the species. More work on if, um, investigating heat stress events, as well as chronic elevated temperatures for any potential kind of bleaching or physiology thresholds. More work on oxygen, um, ocean deoxygenation, so a giant clam will evolve oxygen, but uh, in the nighttime it draws down oxygen as a whole holobiont. And overall, there is a net uh, take from op of oxygen. So we think that deoxygenation would be a problem. And the interaction of global scale uh, to local to regional scale stresses that have not yet been studied, such as ocean warming and ocean darkening or pollution. Field observations are going to continue to be important, so field responses and monitoring of marine um, animals to environmental change, including giant clams, and they really lend themselves to citizen science programs, so we're hoping there's an avenue there, which will also kind of increase public awareness of the problem. There's also desk space work to be done. As I mentioned, the conservation status of giant clam species needs to be updated and this revision is in progress. Also relevant areas um, could update or even include giant clams in their threatened species assessments. And this is something that I'm involved in in the Species Technical Committee for Queensland where we follow the IUCN Red List guidelines. And then just drawing back to that figure at the start, so hopefully you've thought about some of the ways that some of the ideas and concepts that came out of our conservation physiology paper could maybe relate to your species or the ecosystems in which you work. So to summarize the paper, the primary problem here that giant clowns face is global change. And we urgently need to meet net zero greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and even really to progress beyond net zero greenhouse gas emissions to keep our coral reefs in that safe operating space. This is not only for giant clams, but more importantly, all biodiversity. And we know that climate change is the number one threat to not only biodiversity, but human health. 
uh, and the global economy. Meanwhile, while we're getting to that, and we do have the great technology to get to, um, you know, clean renewable energy, we need to focus on conservation strategies to buy populations of our threatened species like giant clams time in the face of such rapid environmental change. And we can see this because on coral reefs, we're getting bleaching in these traditionally cooler La Nina years. So bleaching is becoming an annual event, which is really problematic. So what do we do um, after the paper in terms of engagement? Well, obviously conservation physiology is open access. So that was really great in allowing accessibility for the, um, the actual published research for everyone. We also decided to write a press release and an article in the conversation. Now, the conversation uh, is uh, an outlet in which you pitch your idea to and a professional editor will help you write your article. Uh, and this was really well um, received. It was a really good learning process. I would encourage everyone to have a go. Um, and actually, it was just after um, one of those um, IPCC kind of COP meetings. And um, we had a lot of sort of uptake from, from the work. It went out as the lead article for the day. So the media release and then that sort of public accessible article um, mm -hmm. was really good in helping to get the word out about the paper. I also did sort of radio interviews. Um, we did a bit of TV. Um, there's the, the giant clown specimen that we have in the museum out on display. Um, that, that led to some national radio interviews, and it also uh, led to an international Pacific Beat radio interview. So that was really good engagement for that paper. So post paper, what have we been up to? Um, well, again, I guess sort of just the action on getting the word out about really acting on climate change. Uh, and we had put some of that in the, in the end of the paper. So that was sort of quite a nice message to continue to get out there. Um, and so that's things like more radio interviews. So this is the one that I did last week. And um, we're also continuing to get more collections. So strategic new collections and collection research um, for our threatened species, including giant clams. And try to involve citizen scientists in the projects as well, again, to sort of spread the word. And um, because in some areas like Queensland is such a big coastline, we really need the help of an army of citizen scientists to try to find out how our animals are faring with global change. So that's it from me. Thanks so much for listening. 